shall be called. And then a list of names. Throughout the Christian tradition, that list of names is very important for us to be able to understand. And so the whole series that we're doing as we walk through Advent is to be able to look and say, what are the key names? What are some of the key titles for Jesus? And what does it matter? What does it matter that he's called something Emmanuel? What does it matter that he's called light of the world? What does it matter that he's called king? And what does it matter for me? And it matters because there's two words that sort of guide our understanding of Jesus and Jesus' invitation to us. Just two words. And so on this side, I'm going to ask you to say the first word. And you're going to say it real loud. Remember those days back in high school when you had the I've got spirit, yes, I do moments, all right? And then they yell back at you, right? So you're follow. So everybody say follow. Oh, say it like you mean it. Follow. All right. They passed. Okay. You say me. Ready? Me. Follow me. Follow me. It's just two words. And yet they're such important words for us to be able to wrap our minds around because he says them over and over and over again. He says, follow me. And when he says it, he says it to all kinds of people. He's walking along the seashore. And as he's walking along, he sees two men sitting there mending their nets and their names, Peter and Andrew and their brothers. And they're fishers. That's why they're mending the net. And he says to them, walk away from that net and I will make you fishers of men. All you have to do is follow me. Right? He doesn't stop there. He goes along, and as he's walking further, he comes across this other man. His name's Matthew, and Matthew's sitting there at what's called a tax booth because he's a tax collector, which is a good way to make income back in that time. You're making it on the backs of the people. You get money that you collect. You sort of determine how much it is. You give a certain portion to Rome to make sure they're paid, and you get whatever's left over, and you're determining, in essence, what's the left over. And he comes up to Matthew, and what does he say? And as he's doing that walk, up comes Matthew, and he walks away, just like Peter and Andrew did. He walks away from his tax booth in order to follow him. You go through scripture and you will see story after story after story of him calling people to follow. I'm gonna give you one more. It's the story of this young man who comes to him to ask a question, what does it take for me to inherit eternal life? The side story behind that is he happens to be rich. And he's called the rich young ruler, or the rich young man inside of your scripture. And he says, if you will go sell all of your possessions, give it to the poor and then come follow me. We're talking about eternal life. And what did the rich young ruler do? He walked away. He walked away. And therefore the if is important because Jesus isn't saying, follow me. He's not making it a command. He's making it an invitation and saying, follow me. Because the way that I walk, the way that I walk is the way that you want to. You want to have life in its fullness. You want to experience life in all of its beauty, ups and downs, and still have a confidence as you walk. You want to walk with me. It's only two words. But they're among the most important two words that Jesus ever speaks. Follow me. Now, the question is, by what authority? Right? Who who does he think he is to be able to invite us to do this? And we're going to look into scripture in Matthew's gospel. It's the story of the wise men. We're just going to do the first three verses and we'll sort of flesh it out maybe a little bit as we go through. But I want you to listen for the idea of what right does he have to be able to ask us this question. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born what? King of the Jews, all right? And note, note, 
Who do they go to? King Herod, all right? So you have two kings being mentioned in the same moment. King Herod's not looking forward to this conversation, right? Because he's king of the Jews from his perspective. And now he's got these people that are showing up on his doorstep saying, hey, we're here to worship this new king. For we have observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened in all of Jerusalem with him. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. This, my friends, is the story of the beginning of Advent. And it's the story of us starting to wrap our minds around, when you think of the titles that showed up on the screen, amongst the titles is the title of king. And we are American. And we don't like kings. You remember King George the third? Anybody? Anybody think about maybe uh, this thing called the American Revolution, a tea party that wasn't really a party, a declaration of independence. You remember that stuff? That was to get rid of kings. And so sometimes we as Americans, we wrestle with the idea of having a king that's over us, that has authority over our country. And what this king is saying is it's not just authority over our country, it's authority over you and it's authority over you, and you, and you. It's authority over me. And how do we get to the place of realizing that he is the king? Because that's the story. And we don't focus on it so often. We focus on savior. We focus on the thing that God can do for us, that Jesus can do for us. But we forget that it needs to also be grounded in an idea of realizing that Jesus is king. He's king, Jesus. He's Jesus Messiah, Jesus King. He's somebody that we're meant to follow, that we're supposed to listen to and do the things that he does. And from the beginning of the stories, we see right here, you see in the beginning of the story, it starts with him being identified as king from people outside of Israel, the wise men. Where is the one who is to be born king of the Jews? But it doesn't stop there. It keeps going on. If you jump all the way forward, right? So you got this whole king thing going through all the gospels. You jump forward to the week of his death. And what happens during the week of his death? He's riding in on a mighty stallion called a donkey. All right? He's riding in on a donkey, which you would think that's not a kingly thing, but it is for the Israelites. In that time, there was a, a, a prophecy saying that the king would come in in that way and the people recognized him as king. How do we know? because they took palm branches and they waved them and they stuck them on the ground so that his donkey would be walking across the palm branches, symbolizing that they recognized him as king. A few days later, he goes and has to face the cross. But before that, he's got a trial and he comes before not King Herod. Now there's this guy named Pilate. This is years later, three years later. And now Pilate's here. And what's one of the questions that Pilate asks him? Are you king of the Jews? You say that I am. That's his response. You say that I am. And so when it comes time for his crucifixion, we're still not done with the king story because what happens then, what gets tacked right up here? A sign, a sign that says Jesus, king of the Jews. Not in one language, not in two, but three different languages because the idea is for us to be able to look in here and realize that the message, the irony of the moment is they put that up there to say a bad thing about Jesus. He said that he was king of the Jews, but look at him. But what they're actually proclaiming is truth. And it's proclaimed in three languages because it's the languages of the world. And so that all the people that are seeing that sign or now as we read this, we get the idea that the mention, that the intent is to have it said that he truly is king. But it's not done there. Because if you get out of the gospels, and you get to this book way in the back, it's called Revelation. We don't preach on that one too often. But Revelation, the book of Revelation, there's a moment where, where Jesus is riding in on his mighty white horse. And he's got a bunch of people behind him on white horses too. And it says that he's wearing a robe and on the robe is a title. You know what the title was? Not just king, but king of kings. Lord of lords. It's on his robe and it's on his thigh over here. King of kings, Lord of lords. He's not just a king. He is the king. He's the king. And that's who it is that we seek to follow. 
that's one of the points, guys. When you're, when you're going through Advent, as we're going through this time of preparation, we're meant to be able to recognize who it is that we're worshiping, why we're doing it. Advent is to reveal to us when you get this very beginning story, we have the benefit of the whole rest of the story, but the whole point of this story right here, a good chunk of it, is to say, he is king. He is king. Therefore, follow me. Follow me. And so he does it by that type of authority. He's long awaited. End of the, end of the Old Testament. Beginning of the New Testament. You turn a page, one page in the Bible, all right? You know how many years passages, passes in that one turn? Just one turn? 400 roughly years. 400 years they've been waiting. There's all these promises back here in the Old Testament that they're hoping are going to come to light at some point in the future. And now that moment has come. It's been 400 years of silence, no scriptures, no word from God. And yet now here comes this moment where Jesus is breaking in as king. And there's been an anticipation, a waiting, so much waiting that that's why the wise men are looking it's why the wise men come. They're looking, they're anticipating that something special is about to happen. And so they start following the star that leads them to Jerusalem, that leads them all the way over to Bethlehem, that leads them to the manger. And we're supposed to, during, during this whole time when we're going through Advent, we're supposed to have this, this, this anticipatory heart, this preparing heart of saying there's something special that's going to happen. I can't wait for it to happen. I can't wait. I can't wait. My wife and I, we love to hike. We love to hike. And when we go hiking, especially up in the mountains, anybody go hiking in the mountains? Hike in, in, in the past or even more? You go, right, you go up to the Carolinas. And you, you go hiking up in the mountains. When you go walking up in the mountains, you go off on a trail and, and our, weird, our weird hope is that we get to see a bear, all right? That's our weird thing, right? Everybody wants, everybody want, how many of you have seen a bear, right, out in the wild, all right? Now, I've had this conversation with a couple congregations now. If you were in Cade's Cove and you were in your car, you didn't experience bear, okay? You're inside of a steel cage with windows you can put up. I'm talking about you get out into the woods and you walk along and as you walk along, there's a bear that hasn't been fed Cheetos before, okay? And as you're walking along, you're, you're going and you're walking and you're walking. And we try and get off of trails where there's a lot of other people because they're noisy. And guess what that does to animals? It scares them off, right? So Lynn and I will sort of be very quiet as we walk. I don't want to talk to her anyway. She probably doesn't want to talk to me, right? So, so as we're walking along, we go and all of a sudden you hear the noise. You hear the noise. And what do you do? <gasps> you stop. You stop because you, you don't see anything. You just hear the noise. You hear a rustling. And you, you take this breath in and suddenly you're looking at the direction and saying, what, what is it? What is it? What is it? And then you realize, you realize, I'm not breathing. I got to take a breath. Okay, so I got to take a breath. And, and if, if you get really to realizing, your heart is beating faster because you're going to encounter what turns out to be a squirrel. All right? <laughs> and, and then there's this cute little squirrel and you're like, curse you squirrel. All right? But every once in a while, every once in a while, maybe one in a hundred, who knows, one in a hundred, Lynn and I will encounter a bear. And when you do, and you don't have the car around you, that breath, that heart rate, that feeling, it's like the anticipation now realized, oh, it's so cool. It's so cool. You know, in, in um, the Chronicles of Narnia, the, the whole idea in the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, Aslan appears, right? And Aslan represents Christ, and he's a lion, and one of the great lines in that story is that he's not tame, but he's good. He's not tame, but he's good. And so when we encounter Christ, we're supposed to have sort of that same type of feeling like Lynn and I have when we're on the trail and suddenly you encounter the bear. It's not tame and you feel the not tameness of the bear. There's a little bit of fear in there, but there's also excitement all mixed into one all mixed into one. And that becomes the invitation for us. Frederick Buechner talked about this moment. He's talking about Advent. He's sort of talking about that moment, the anticipation, the preparation. This is what he says. The extraordinary thing that is about to happen is matched only by the extraordinary moment just 
before it happens. You hear the rustling in the brush and you turn and you look and you're getting all almost the exact same feelings before you even see it. And he goes on to say, Advent is the name of that moment. Advent's the name of that moment. That anticipatory moment where your heart is racing, your breath is caught, and you're wondering what's going to happen next. That is Advent. Now, here's the challenge we face, circling back to the whole king thing. We think we are the king. All right? We think that we're the king. I remember growing up in my, my, my house with my dad, all right? So my parents were divorced. My dad raised me up, had stepmother named Gloria. Wonderful family. We, I love my family. All extended step parents, the whole McGill, right? My dad would sit in his Ethan Allen dark brown wood chair with orange cushions. And if you're of the era, and a good chunk of you are, any of you remember TV without remotes? All right, all right. And my dad had this awesome power as king to be able to say to me, son, Walter Cronkite's coming on. Turn it to channel 13. And his remote control would walk over and turn the channel. And there was only what, three, maybe four channels. And whenever things were coming on, I was the remote control. My children never got to experience the gift of being my remote control because there was remote controls by that time. So they didn't get to hear King Richard from his Ethan Allen chair say, Brianna, change thy channel for thy master, right? I didn't get to do that. But we all, we all get to be kings now. We get to live better than kings. How many of you have Alexa? Or how many of you have Siri, all right? And I love doing this for our online people because whenever you say the word Alexa, it sets off Alexa in their house, okay? So I can say, Alexa, tell the people at home to come to church. (laughs) And she'll now say those words to them, all right? And I didn't say it. It's Alexa. It's not my fault, right? So Alexa or Siri, and you say, Alexa, Siri. I was sitting up. I have a, a, a... Townhouse, right? So I have an upstairs and there's like a little loft that looks over the kitchen area or the, the living room area. And every once in a while I'm sitting there and the TV's off and I'll be like, oh man, in the past, I used to have to walk all the way downstairs myself to grab the remote to turn on the TV. You know what I can do now? Hey Siri, turn on the TV. You know what she does? She turns on the TV. If you've ordered pizza before, you can get her to order the pizza for you. And you know what will happen? The pizza will be paid for. The pizza will arrive at your door. We think we are kings. We're living better than kings. But we're not meant to be the king. We are not the king. We are what is called by Paul ambassadors. We are ambassadors. We're not the king. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is the one, the one who represents the king, the one who, who speaks for the king, who might receive words from the king and spread them out to other people. Do you hear it? Do you hear ambassador? Do you hear disciple all woven into the one? We are ambassadors for Christ. We're meant to, to speak the words that Christ would speak. We're supposed to be Christ's presence to represent the king on behalf of who the king is and how the king would call us to live. We are ambassadors. Now, way back, way back in the older Christian times, so in the 400s, 500s, there was what was called the monastic movement. And in order for us to get to the place where we can embrace Jesus as king, there's a word that needs to come or a thought that needs to be inside or a heart that has to be felt within us in order to get that right. And within that monastic movement was a person named St. Benedict. And St. Benedict started multiple monasteries. He started the most famous one is Monte Cassino in Italy. 
And he had what was called a rule because whenever he had a monastery, you would create a rule for the people that were in that monastery to be able to follow, to be able to walk that journey. And it was an agreement amongst that community to say, this is the things that we do that represent us as a community. So the community of Benedictines might be different than the Jesuits, which might be different than Franciscans. But the thing that I love about the Benedictine is the first word of his rule because the first word And the first word maybe for Advent that we need to sort of just embrace is the word, listen. Listen. Here's how it goes. Listen to the instructions of your master, your king, and incline the ear of your heart. Cheerfully receive and faithfully put into practice the guidance of your father who loves you. Isn't that a beautiful opening to a rule? Listen. Identify where your heart is. Put into practice. Follow, in this case, what he's saying is follow him. He's obeying God's command to him as St. Benedict and saying, follow Jesus. And the way to do that is you need to start by listening. This is not just the rule at Benedict's monastery. It is the invitation of Advent. And the question is, are we listening? And when he calls, will we? Will we? It's the beginning of what's called the Christian New Year right now. This is the beginning. New Year for normal, calendar one would be January, but from the Christian tradition, The Christian calendar has this Sunday as the first Sunday of the new year. It's a great time as we approach approach the birth of Jesus to maybe reappraise and think, am I truly seeking to listen? And when I hear the words, am I seeking to do it? Because he calls us to interesting and challenging places. And the thing is, Advent, Advent isn't pointing towards baby Jesus. It's pointing towards King Jesus. So as we celebrate for Christmas, the whole idea is to to wrap yourself, your mind, your heart around the idea that this is King Jesus that we're seeking to follow. And he's calling, calling you and you and you and you and you to follow me. And my prayer, my hope, is that you're on a journey, you're walking through the woods, and in your heart you feel a little something or you see a little something, and it causes your breath to be taken away is you wonder, what is it? And it might just be, if you're paying attention and if you're listening closely enough, Jesus Christ saying, I love you. I want what's best for you. Follow me. Let's pray. God, as we come into this time of Advent, help us to pause. Help us to realize who you are, what you want for us, the life that can be, not the life that we're having right now. Not a life of fear where we look out into the world and to all that's going on that is bad and ugly and evil but to be able to look inside ourselves, to realize that your spirit dwells within us. And because of that, God, the things that we fear, they can be washed aside. Instead of having fear of it, we face it because we have King Jesus with us and we seek to follow him wherever he leads. Open our hearts this Christmas season, we pray. We pray it in his name, King Jesus. And we all say, amen. Pause, take a breath. Feel the beating of your heart.
and listen. Because he's saying, 